Syrian troops stepped up shelling of opposition forces in the southern city of Dara over the weekend after a negotiated ceasefire failed to hold. It is just the latest battle in what is now a decade-long conflict that's left heavy carnage and suffering in its wake. For more, we turn to CGTN Shu Deju at the United Nations. And Shu Deju, the war may have disappeared from the headlines, but the toll on the Syrian people, it's been staggering. Uh, take us through some of that and the latest attempts by the UN to try and help manage this crisis. Yes, Mike, actually, according to UN's High Commissioner for Refugees, in the past 10 years of civil war, more than 13 million people are in need now for humanitarian access and also protection. More than 90% of Syrians now, they live in poverty. And also 6.7 million have been displaced internally and 5.5 million fled their own country. And though there, there are reports suggested that uh, about half a million people died during the war, but actually the United Nations stopped counting the death toll a long time ago because there's simply impossible, it's impossible to get the accurate number. Now last month, actually, um, the UN Security Council just voted to extend uh, Bab al Hawa, a border crossing for another year for the humanitarian access, uh, which is a vital move for the civilians in the northwest Syria, namely the rebel-controlled area in Idlib. However, this probably is the last thing that the Security Council uh, member states could agree on. As for the southwest Syria, fight erupted just like you said in, in the province of Dara between the government forces and rebel groups. When I was in Syria in 2018, they negotiated a truce, or as the Syrian government called, a national reconciliation. And this just reminded us how fragile this truce would be. And also the uh, UN Special Envoy Jer Peterson urged the international community to come up with a more constructive dialogue to help end humanitarian crisis. I believe we need a new constructive international dialogue on Syria to discuss concrete steps, steps that should be reciprocal and mutual, defined with realism and precision, implemented in parallel and which are verifiable. There are worrying signs that ISIL may be strengthening, given the increased frequency and reach of its latest attacks. Other listed terrorist groups remain at large and in control of territory. The UN's World Food Program also said that 60% of Syrian's population is at risk of going hungry again this year, which is the highest number during the history of this conflict. Now the question is, how and when will the international community to help end Syrians' hunger crisis or humanitarian crisis or Syrian crisis overall? Mike. Good question. Uh, thanks so much. That's CGTN Xu Dejou reporting from the United Nations. There's a lot to talk about on this broadcast. Let's get right to our panel. Edmund Garib is a Middle East scholar, author, and analyst, political and economic affairs commentator Einar Tangent is joining us from Beijing. And with us from Damascus is press TV correspondent Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad, you're there on the ground. So give us your sense of what's going on. This fighting uh, taking place in southwestern Syria, as Xu Dejou was talking about, this just above the border of Jordan. Um, this is an area where this uh, rebellion actually started 10 years ago. There's some kind of uh, reports that are somewhat conflicting about Russia mediating some sort of ceasefire. What can you tell us about what's going on there? Yes, let me start about, uh, with what happened uh, previously. In 2018, the Syrian army was able to take control of most of uh, the governorate, the city and the countryside. And in some areas where uh, there were still armed uh, groups in control, those uh, uh, armed groups agreed uh, to sign a reconciliation deal in which they surrender their weapons uh, in exchange for an amnesty from the government and they, were, they would be able to return back to life and the government institutions will be working back in those areas. However, uh, there were specific areas like Dara al Balad, areas there, armed groups refused to sign such a deal. Now, because there were a, a large number of civilians, and still uh, the Syrian army was patient and did not wage a military offensive. But recently, there was it was clearly uh, uh, it was clear that the Syrian army uh, uh, took a decision uh, to secure that area and get rid of the armed groups inside there. 
So there were negotiations, there were reinforcements by the Syrian army sent to encircle Dara al Balad, and then negotiations with Russian mediation started between the Syrian army and uh, those armed groups in Dara al Balad and the notables uh, uh, inside Dara, those who have influence over those uh, leaders of the armed groups. Uh, the negotiations were successful at first, then uh, the agreement was violated, in which there were militants who are against getting out of Dara and against signing the deal. They want to stay inside Dara. But because those armed groups have been for three years attacking with mortar in civilian areas and government-held parts of Dara, using explosives also to attack Syrian uh, checkpoints and positions, the Syrian army under the Syrian constitution has a role, which is to uh, ensure security and stability uh, on all Syrian territories. So there's a decision. Those armed groups have two options. Either leave those who are against uh, a reconciliation deal, or there will be an offensive in order to get rid of them. So talk to us about uh, Dara. What does it look like uh, right now? Because I was looking at some images coming from the region. It looks like everybody's in cars. It's clogged. People want to get out of there. Uh, the, and, and also the war itself. Talk to us about the human toll and the toll on infrastructure. Well, definitely uh, the biggest loser in any war uh, will be the civilians at the end of the day. Civilians uh, have the right to, to be afraid whenever there is war. Uh, but let's remind everyone that there are terrorist groups inside Dara. Uh, the Syrian government regards uh, those uh, armed groups as terrorist groups over there. They have been occupying those areas. They have been looting uh, uh, people's houses, using civilian uh, areas as their strongholds. And this, of course, uh, is will not be safe for the civilians themselves. Uh, many left the country. Uh, many were internally displaced uh, because of the terrorist uh, occupation of various parts of the country throughout, of course, uh, the war. The situation in Dara is not different from any area where militants used to occupy or be present inside Syria. At the end of the day, there is a mission there, uh, under Syria's constitution for the Syrian army to ensure security and stability. But with the presence of armed groups that attack uh, government-held parts of uh, Syria, here we're speaking about Dara, it is important that the army uh, makes any kind of solution, whether peacefully through reconciliation or militarily, to get rid of those uh, uh, terrorists. But at the end of the day, uh, what is important for the Syrian army is not to harm civilians in such a, in such a move, if it was a military one. So this is what is happening. The Syrian army is being patient. It's trying its best in order to uh, solve out this situation peacefully through a deal. Edmund, let me get, uh, I've got a couple of questions for you, but let me get your sense of how Washington is uh, viewing what's happening in Dara. Well, clearly Washington is concerned about what's been going on in that area and they very much the expressions of concern for the civilian population and for a civilian solution or civil solution to this uh, conflict. And of course, in the past, there has been criticism of uh, the Syrian government and its policies, but uh, the situation on the ground is uh, tense. And uh, I think this is important uh, and has gained increased importance recently because of the situation between Syria and Israel on the one hand, and also between Jordan and Syria, because the Jordanian uh, government, would, when the Jordanian king came to Washington a few weeks ago, he wanted to open up to trade with Syria and uh, asked for the U.S. for support. But uh, this situation makes it much more complex, much more difficult. And that's why it's important to get a solution for the situation in Dira, which, as you pointed out, and uh, as we heard also from your uh, reporter there, that this is where uh, the conflict in Syria starts. You know, internal opposition uh, and the West uh, wanted Assad gone as president. Uh, that has not happened. Uh, he just won his fourth seven-year term, uh, captured 95 percent of the vote. Of course, in the West, they're calling this a, a sham election. But nevertheless, um, after a decade of fighting, he's still standing. Uh, he, in fact, in, he's doing well in many respects. Uh, why do you think that is? How, how has he been able to survive all of this? Actually, that's a very good point. I think there was a lot of... Uh, Basically, uh, uh, around 2010, 2011, uh, you remember the Arab Spring, uh, where uh, the large numbers of people uh, who were very unhappy with their governments came down to the streets and were protesting. And those protests, which started in Tunisia, which now is going through uh, another phase of, of that uh, revolution, uh, uh, actually brought down the president. Uh, this happened also in Egypt. So basically, many... Uh, of the Syrian opposition to the 
uh, President Bashar al-Assad in Damascus felt that this was all going to happen in Syria. They believe that this is uh, very similar to what's happening in other parts uh, of, uh, of the Arab world. But uh, the situation in Syria is much more complex. It's quite different than what happened in Tunisia, in Egypt, or in Yemen, or in Sudan, where uh, presidents were forced to leave, resign. Uh, Syria is much more complex. The country is much more divided. Uh, its social, sectarian, uh, ethnic makeup is quite different, and that makes it much more complex. And uh, we saw a division in, in the country between those who supported the government and those who were opposed to it. And later on, when even though the government appeared to be losing uh, much of the territory, they controlled most of the cities, such as Damascus, Aleppo, Homs, uh, Latakia. These are the major uh, cities. And then around 1915, they began to get uh, support from uh, Russia and from uh, Hezbollah uh, and uh, uh, Iran. Uh, and that helped also the regime strengthen its base and then expand its control uh, to most of the uh, areas of Syria, except uh, part pockets in the south, and then what we see in the uh, northeast of Syria, where on one side you have the Kurds in control, right. on the other you have the uh, uh, Islamic forces supported by Turkey uh, in control in Idlib. Uh, in, in complicated uh, battlefield, nonetheless. Uh, China and Syria uh, established diplomatic relations 65 years ago. Einer, uh, let's talk a little bit about that because Chinese State Counselor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi was just in uh, Damascus, met with Assad. Um, he said Beijing would support reconstruction efforts in the country. Um, in fact, he even talked about Belt and Road uh, Initiative uh, perhaps being uh, in play there as well. Talk to us about how you see uh, Beijing once the dust settles. I mean, the infrastructure's just been torn apart, so much of the country in ruins. Where do you see China fitting into this puzzle? Well, unfortunately, this is not uh, an only example. You go to Iraq, uh, you know, Yemen, uh, Afghanistan. There's a series of broken countries that are now being abandoned, uh, both by Europe and the United States. Uh, in, uh, basically, it was a failed experiment to try to see if they could impose uh, their kind of, you know, liberal democracy. Uh, it hasn't worked. It's left carnage in its wake. And now uh, China is trying to figure out how it can be a constructive force in trying to create uh, regional stability. But that is a long road. There's a tremendous amount of money involved. Uh, and the question is political risk and stability. And it's interesting. I want to ask you, Edmund, about that. He says it's a failed experiment. I mean, we're talking about the 10-year anniversary of the Arab Spring. You, you've touched on Tunisia and, and some of the other countries. It, it, it was seen early on as kind of this heady effort towards democracy. I mean, when historians look back at this period in the Middle East, uh, what are they going to write about the Arab Spring? Uh, really, that's a very, very good question, because I think there were a lot of hopes uh, that the Middle East is going to witness a lot of changes. There's going to be moved towards more uh, democratization, more, more liberalization, at least in some parts, although there were other forces that wanted uh, to a return to a more Islamic society, for example. That's what we're seeing now in uh, in, in Tunisia, for example, you have a, a secular president and uh, forces, uh, secular forces supporting him. As well. And on the other hand, you have al uh, which is an Islamist uh, group. And so there is that. Uh, nevertheless, what we have seen, unfortunately, is that it has not led to uh, democratic change in many uh, of the countries of the, uh, of the region. Uh, what we have seen is a return in many, in many places to strong uh, government rules, centralized rule to uh, military uh, governments in some areas. Uh, there, Tunisia perhaps might be one of the best examples of where there might be a chance to see a more open uh, society, and that has to do, again, with the unique background of, uh, of Tunisia. Uh, Yemen, we see there is a lot of conflict. Uh, Sudan also uh, is a, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. It's still uh, in, uh, uh, right now in the midst of what, the changes that have taken place. Uh, but I think this is a significant uh, uh, development uh, that we have seen, at least in yeah. some countries, and it reflects the need for change. Nevertheless, some of the change uh, that was coming was, in fact, and that's why in Syria uh, we, we see what we are seeing, is that there were a lot of people who were opposed to the uh, 
uh, forces uh, who appear to be uh, opposed to the government, the central government, and yeah. they, many of them, prefer to support uh, the central government uh, rather than the opposition. Well, Mohammed, let me get back to the human cost of this war. The UN Special Envoy to Syria, Geer Patterson, uh, talked about that recently. Let's listen to a little bit of what he had to say. It is almost incomprehensible in scale. With 13 million people forced to flee their homes within Syria and abroad, half the country's pre-war population. This is a profound humanitarian and national tragedy, and also a ticking time bomb for regional stability. We need to see actions that create the necessary conditions and confidence for safe, dignified, and voluntarily return. Mohammed, let me ask you, not as a journalist, but just as a person, you know, as when he puts it in these stark terms, just describe for us what it's like to have lived there uh, for the last decade, not just report on it, but to have to kind of live through this, uh, you know, what's, what's happened in your country. Yes, definitely it was very difficult for Syrians from all walks of life inside the country to live uh, during uh, this war. Uh, at first, in the first uh, six or seven years, it was very dangerous. It was very difficult for Syrians. For example, here in Damascus, uh, people uh, used to go to their uh, jobs fearing that a mortar could land uh, uh, near them and they would be killed. They, uh, despite that, they used to go to their jobs. They want to live their life and challenge what is happening. Uh, uh, there were mortars falling, falling on schools from uh, areas that uh, terrorists control. There are so many challenges, military speaking on the security level over here and the situation however now just three years ago and starting since three years ago the situation is difficult uh, from another aspect economically speaking there is uh, an economic war on Syria now uh, people uh, the, the Syrian pound is dropping uh, rapidly uh, uh, before the US dollar uh, the, the there there are so many uh, unilateral sanctions by the United States by Europe uh, of course, and that all of that is affecting the daily lives of the Syrians. Uh, for example, those sanctions are affect how they're affecting their daily lives. Even the Syrian government, for example, the Central Bank of Syria, cannot make any transaction in light of such sanctions in order to import uh, goods for Syrians, uh, uh, food, uh, medicine, anything they need. So it's a very difficult situation currently, economically speaking. Uh, uh, of course, uh, unlike what was before that, those three years, it was militarily a difficult situation on the security uh, level inside the country. But in both cases, Syrians are living a, a very difficult life, and there should be a kind of solution. The international communities should do something in order to lift those sanctions, the economic sanctions, which are affecting not the government, but the Syrians. But if you ask many analysts, many Syrians on the street, even the ordinary Syrians, they'll tell you that after the United States and its allies failed to topple Syria's president militarily, now they are starving uh, through those sanctions, the Syrian people, hoping that the people would go against their government and their president. Let me ask you a, a follow-up on this, because you're, you're talking about adults like yourself, where undoubtedly it's very difficult. You're talking about the economic uh, impact of all of this squeeze there. But nearly 2.5 million of the kids there are are out of school, 1.6 million more at risk of dropping out. These children there, uh, many of them have never known a day when they're, they weren't at war. Uh, what has it done to the children? What does their future look like? Well, their future will be definitely better if the international community helps Syria, not imposes sanctions on Syria, if reconstruction starts in Syria in order to build a better Syria. Now, I'm not sure about the numbers because even the United Nations cannot count them correctly. At the end of the day, there are areas that are under terrorist control in which even the United Nations cannot enter or count uh, people over there, whether the death toll, whether the, the, the students out of school or any other number. But uh, definitely, it is uh, a very bad situation. There should be help given to the Syrian people. There shouldn't be uh, countries like the United States and its allies, uh, European countries uh, in particular, imposing sanctions, standing in the face of reconstructing Syria and helping Syrians and in, in, in giving hope to refugees uh, in order to convince them to come back to their country. Uh, those are very important uh, issues. And if those uh, uh, countries do not lift such sanctions, definitely the war will continue. And such, the, the humanitarian crisis will continue. And a very important also issue is that if the United States, which is illegally present in Syria, occupying parts of Syria without a UN mandate, without the consent of the Syrian government, if Turkish forces, which are also illegally in Syria, do not get out 
also the country will remain divided, and this will prolong the crisis inside Syria. Einer, let's talk a little bit about uh, Wang Yi's trip there to Syria, because uh, it, once again, he reiterated China's stance, which is they do not want regime change in Syria. And uh, for his part, Assad said that Syria supports China unconditionally on the issues, these issues of Taiwan, Xinjiang, and Hong Kong. Can you talk about this geopolitical relationship between these two countries? Well, unfortunately, it has a lot to do with uh, the problems between China and the U.S. There's this kind of growing Cold War, which has kind of bled over into this, these other areas. Now, to make it clear, China is not interested in any regime change anywhere, and they uh, have often stated that. So it's not an exception. They're not saying they're in favor of Bashir Assad. In particular, they're just saying that countries have the right to pursue their own path. These instigations and interventions have led to nothing but tragedy. And we've seen that time and time again, whether it's uh, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, other things. It, it's time to withdraw, to stop providing guns and ammunition and bombs to these, uh, these combatants and get them to the table so that they can figure out what their differences are and how they can go ahead. Because as has been pointed out, it's the civilians who are suffering because of this. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem that uh, the U.S. and many other countries who have intervened even care anymore. Well, Edmund uh, Einer teed things up. He says, you know, put down the guns. We've got to ta have talks. And uh, this gets back to Patterson, who's the fourth Syrian envoy. They call his job Mission Impossible. Um, he, of course, just recently met with in Moscow with uh, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia. Prior to that, he was in Rome, where he met with uh, U.S. Secretary of State uh, Tony Blinken and European diplomats. He said it's time for everybody to kind of sit down at the table, kind of put their cards on the table, come up with solutions. But we've been talking about diplomatic solutions for this war for some time now. Do you see any signs that that's a direction that we can actually see in the near future? Uh, the divisions are deep, uh, and they are real. In fact, uh, much of the problem that we have seen in Syria is the fact that many countries intervene in countries' affairs, and they supported this party or that. They supported one faction. Even the opposition is fragmented. There are tens of organizations, and they were supported by different countries in, in the region. And that makes it very complex, because Syria has a very important geostrategic position uh, in that part of the world. And a lot of countries are interested, not only the regional players, such as Turkey or Jordan or Saudi Arabia or the Gulf, other Gulf countries or Israel, but also uh, the, you have uh, the Europeans, the Americans who have supported uh, to, with varying degrees of, uh, of support uh, to the opposition. So basically the situation became much more complex than uh, a lot of people thought, and that's why there is a need for dialogue among the different parties, and that's why there is a need for real dialogue, not just going through the motions. And uh, uh, we are beginning to see, at least the Russians are beginning to make a new effort. We'll see where the, whether that's going to go anywhere. And that's basically to try to bring in some opposition elements uh, from different fa factions uh, and try to get them to sit down also with the op uh, other parts of the, uh, of the opposition, as well as with the Syrian uh, government, and perhaps that might uh, at least move things forward. I think China also is playing an important role now. The visit uh, was very significant that it occurred to the day after President Assad uh, swore the oath after his uh, the election uh, victory. And uh, at the same time, they called on for an end to efforts uh, colored, to have more color revolutions, and they talked about uh, trying to lift the sanctions, that that's the best way also to help uh, the Syrian people, and most of these sanctions are imposed by Western countries, and therefore I think there might be a new effort, and there has been a meeting recently that we all know about between President uh, uh, Biden and President Putin, and there was talk about Syria. Hopefully, some discussion is still going on, and if that takes place, that might make it a little bit easier uh, to reach some kind of an agreement, because there is a need uh, to uh, get the support of the foreign players who are backing different factions on the ground. Well, Mohammed, let me ask you about, uh, you know, when you're out on the streets of Damascus, what's the sense there? I mean, obviously, you'd like to see everybody sit down at the table and hash out some kind of solution. You want the guns to be put down. I mean, this is actually impacting your life and others there in the country. Are people hopeful, or, or have you heard this tune before? 
Well, they're definitely hopeful. Uh, they want to rebuild their country. They have suffered for 10 years, and they have witnessed all kinds of difficulties. They have witnessed uh, the war. They have witnessed the economic war, the military war. Uh, uh, so definitely, uh, they are uh, hopeful. Uh, they want to challenge the current circumstances. They do believe that they are the only ones who will be capable to rebuild uh, their country. But at the same time, they know that this is difficult, because there are so many countries that have interests inside Syria and do not want Syria to be stronger. For example, Israel, it's an enemy to Syria. It occupies parts of Syria and continues until this day to attack Syria illegally. The United States also, it occupies parts of Syria and it occupies uh, the richest part of oil resources there, giving all of those oil resources almost to the so-called Syria's democratic forces and depriving the entire country and entire Syrians in other areas from such resources. And because of that, for example, Syrians only see six hours in a day out of 24 with electricity power because there are no resources, gas resources, to, to fuel the gas stations and provide electricity. This is just one of the wow. impacts of the U.S. occupation there. Well, so it's very difficult, but they do want those foreign forces to leave. They want economic sanctions to be lifted, right. and they want to build their country. Uh, we're just about out of time. Einar, briefly, if you can, um, I was just reading today the Syrian rescue workers known as the White Helmet said that their teams had responded to 330 attacks since the beginning of June. 89 people died, including 27 children. You don't read about this in the newspapers uh, lately. Uh, what do you think the message is there about the international community kind of turning the page on what's happening in Syria, all the suffering still continuing? What are your thoughts? Well, it's the same as Afghanistan. What, uh, these countries have broken, and now people are walking away. Uh, it's going to take a concerted effort by the world. This is not as simple as uh, even my, uh, <clears throat> uh, my <laughs> colleagues have just expressed. Uh, there are moves both by Russia and Iran who are interested in this area and preventing more uh, Western uh, uh, types of forces uh, gaining more ground there. So it has to be stopped and looked at as a chessboard and start looking at this as a group of people who need aid. And that's China's position. Uh, and we are going to leave it there. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Some great insights there. Appreciate the debate. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching.